I think it's probably a good caution for all of us to be careful here because this may be very familiar material. And there's a danger in very familiar materials that you think you already have it. The only assurance against truth is the presumption you already have it. Anything else will yield, you see. And uh, uh, I find myself doing that too. Sometimes I'll encounter a, a session of scripture that I've been over so many times I've attended to, to, to skim a little. Big mistake. Because it, the word of God is inexhaustible. So it's in that spirit I suggest we just pause, set aside uh, 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 some of our presuppositions, and let's just see what uh, the Lord Jesus Christ penned in these seven epistles. And so we're going to just jump right in here. The revelation of Jesus Christ. This is really uh, the closure, if you will, on the church. The church is not an organization. When we use that term, we usually refer to an organization or even a building. Biblically, the church is an organism. It's an organism. It grows. And it, it, has, it has issues. And uh, so the book of Acts, really, is a, a portrayal of the approximately the first 30 years of the church, from Acts chapter 2 onwards, focusing on three people. Say the Acts of the, people say it's the Acts of the Apostles. I'm always amused by that, because two of the three people featured there are apostles. One was a deacon, but the point is, Philip, Peter, and Paul are the three that are featured. And uh, uh, that's fine, but it isn't, it, the, uh, some people say it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. People who say that strike me as being a little superficial because the Holy Spirit works very hard to be invisible. He's, he never speaks of himself, Jesus tells us in John 16. And when he's in a, when he's in a metaphor, he's always the unnamed servant. And uh, so uh, it's, it, it's it, I just, even in, in uh, Genesis 24, he's unnamed, even though you can tell his name by going back to chapter 17, that his name is Eliezer, which means comforter, the, 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 so forth. Anyway, the point is, the book of Acts on every page, in every sermon, is centered on the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Not only is it Christ-centered, every, every episode, every sermon in the book of Acts is centered on the person of Jesus Christ. And, uh, the, and specifically makes reference to his resurrection. And I mention that because the book of Acts underscores that on every page, and yet, it's probably hard to find a pulpit in which the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the centerpiece, except maybe on Easter Sunday or something. Anyway, the first 30 years, book of Acts. The next 2,000 are summarized in seven letters that were drafted by none other than the Lord himself. And so that's what we're going to explore, those, those letters. And the, it's the revelation Notice it's singular, not plural. When I see somebody speak of revelations plural, I know he hasn't read the book. It's not a collection of revelations. It's a single revelation. It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. The word apocalypse means the unveiling. It's singular, a single unveiling. Of what? Of Jesus. And uh, it represents the consummation of all things. They all started in Genesis. They're all consum uh, consummated in uh, the last book. It's a very audacious book because it's the only book in the Bible that promises you a special blessing if you read it. No other book in the Bible has the audacity to do that. Many places they read the Bible, study the Word of God as some kind of collective, sure. This book promises you a special blessing, and so you can claim that tonight. No matter how much I butcher this or mess this up and so forth, I know you'll get a blessing, not from me, but from the Lord, because he's promised it here. So I'm very comfortable tonight because it's my trust that he's in charge. Now, there are 404 verses uh, in this book, <clears throat> but believe it or not, it contains over 800 allusions from the Old Testament. That's a lot. Now, the reason I emphasize that is the reason it sounds so strange to our ears, typically, is because we haven't done our homework in the Old Testament. And it's a real eye-opener for a serious New Testament reader to jump into this. That really started me on my quest as a kid. I attended a lecture by a brilliant teacher, and uh, he, he it made the statement that the book of Revelation is entirely in code, but every code is unra unraveled elsewhere in the Scripture. And I thought, wow, 
I didn't know that. And that began a treasure hunt that's been going on for about 65 years for me. And uh, if you really study this book, the book of Revelation, and track down each of the idioms or metaphors, whatever, there are figures of speech in the book. And there's, in fact, there's quite a few different kinds. In fact, there's 200 different kinds of rhetorical devices in the book. And they've been cataloged and all that. But uh, the main point is to recognize that all these allusions are typically from the Old Testament, some from the New. But they all point, obviously, to aspects of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's, of course, the epitome, the climax of God's plan for mankind. And the question is, to whom is this given? I know it's amazing how many people don't pay attention to the very first sentence. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Good so far? Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. Who was it given? To Jesus Christ. Wow! No wonder it's high-level stuff. Why did, was it shown to him? Gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it, but rendered it into signs uh, by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ of, and of all things that he saw. He was writing down what he saw. Okay? All right. Now, you get to verse 3, and here it hits you right in the eyes, what I said earlier. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. And keep those things. Ah, there's the footnote. Keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. Right now, this is an interesting verse. You get to verse 19 of this uh, book. It's a book that has its own outline. It's outlined for you in verse 19. It divides the book into three parts. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. This is verse 19. So by the time you've gotten to the 19th verse, John has seen a vision of Jesus Christ. And that occupies verses 1 through 18, up to verse 18. Then Jesus instructs him, write the things which you have seen. That's chapter 1. He's just seen this vision. And the things which are, that exist today, and that's going to turn out to be chapter 2 and 3. And the things which shall be metatauta, after these things, or here, uh, hereafter. So the first, th chapter 1, is the vision of Christ. Chapters 2 and 3 are the seven churches. And uh, chapters 4 through 22 follows after the churches. You with me? Okay. So we're going to focus on chapters 2 and 3. And I'm going to call these the ultimate report card. And uh, so, the last verse of chapter 1, I want to put right in front of us as an example of the statement I made earlier. Because in chapter 1, we saw earlier seven stars. He says, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. These are two idioms or metaphors that were used earlier in this chapter. He's here, he closed, before the chapter closes, he's going to explain what they are. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches. The seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. We, what everybody misses is, these lampstands are in chapter 1 on the earth. When we get to chapter 4, or I should say, when you get to, we're not going to go in there today, but when you go to chapter 4, it opens up with the lampstands being in heaven. What are the lampstands? The churches. So the churches are focused on chapters 2 and 3. Many people, there are a lot of good scholars with different views, but that's one that many miss, that, that whole issue. Now we're going to explore seven epistles, seven letters, that are all dictated by Jesus Christ. When we study those seven letters, we'll discover that each of the letters is composed of seven elements. They have a, a pattern, a style, an order. They're all identical with a couple of exchanges. Each one starts with the name of the church. 
and we're going to discover the very name of the church is a clue to the key message in that church. Each church has a unique set of situations. The name typifies that. Jesus selects a title of himself as the sender. It's recognizable as Jesus, of course, but he picks a title that emphasizes the message he's getting across to that particular church. We discover that every, it, it is in my intensive study, not just of this book, but especially this book, I'm convinced that there, every detail in the scripture is there deliberately. The rabbis have a very colorful way of summarizing. They say, we really won't understand the scripture until the Messiah comes. But when the Messiah comes, he'll not only interpret the passages, he'll interpret the very words. In fact, he'll interpret the very letters. In fact, he'll even interpret the spaces between the letters. And when I first heard that, I smiled. I thought that's a very colorful exaggeration. I'm not convinced now it's an exaggeration at all. I think it may be much more precise than maybe even that rabbi fully appreciated. Then there is, it's a report card, so there's a commendation, here's what you've done well, here's what you haven't done so well, I'm concerned about, and there's exhortation. I want you to notice those three middle items. There's a, here's the good news, here's the bad news, and here's what you need to do about it. The commendation, hey, you did this and this and this, great. Good for you. Boy, you hear the Messiah applaud what he's doing there. But then he'll say some concerns, nevertheless, and he'll have some concerns, typically. And on the basis of those concerns, there'll be an exhortation. Now, because of those concerns, I want you to do this, 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 this. Get the picture? It's, it's, it's a performance review. Okay? It's followed by a promise to the overcomer. Each of the seven letters has a specific promise to the one that's going to be a medical, a, a partaker of Christ. There is a phrase that closes each letter. Each letter has this little catchphrase. He that hath an ear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That little phrase is tagged on each of the seven letters. But there's something subtle and different about that that I'll highlight as we go. As we go. Now the seven, the seven churches are the things that are. Remember he wrote, he gave you the outline in chapter 1 verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen. That's the the, the vision of Christ in chapter 1. That vision of Christ, by the way, introduces 24 uh, descriptives about Christ. And those 24 will be littered all through the book. They're like a programmer's definition, if you will. Okay. Now the question we want to start by asking ourselves, why did Jesus pick these seven? They're a very strange group of seven. And uh, we... Uh, uh, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So why these seven? We're going to get into Ephesus. Several of those you, you know from your Bible. Most of them you haven't ever heard of before this book. The, the, the her churches that you think would be the biggest ones. The church in Jerusalem is not mentioned. The base for the Gentile outreach in the early church was the church at Antioch. It's not here. You can go through all kinds of churches that were bigger. The church at Rome. None of those are here. These seven, why these seven? We're going to discover these seven have a very strange mystical property that we'll explore as we go. But each one of these have this peculiar phrase attached to them. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And upon study, we discover there's at least four different purposes of these letters. Uh, the first one <coughs> is they were local churches. Sir William Ramsey and others have researched that period, and it turns out there are justifiable uh, allusions in these letters to those churches literally. There, there are linkages of, of, of that literal church that day. So they, these aren't made up. These are real churches. But Jesus chosen these because he, by commenting on this, he's going to accomplish several things. And so it has a local. They were little, little real places. But there's another thing. It says... He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That means we all should listen, to look at all the letters. The letters aren't written only to Ephesus, Smyrna, and so forth. All the letters apply some way to all the churches. You with me so far? Once you discover the real theme of each letter, you can profile any church you've been in, good or bad or indifferent, in terms of those seven characteristics. So the point is they're, they're a way of calibrating where the churches are strong or weak. Follow me? So 
so far. So they're admonitory. They involve admonitions, if you will. But we also discovered that he that hath an ear... How many of you have an earlobe? Can I see a show of hands? Then this was written to you too, personally. So there's a personal or homiletic thing, okay? He that, he that hath an ear, let him hear. That's her, or that's a him and Mr. and Mrs. him, okay? All right. So the point is there's a personal application. And that may be your most important one today, to see how that might fit you. But here's the, up, up, up till now, you're, it's very comfortable. Sure, okay, I get all that. Let me tell you the corkscrew, the real surprise, the boomerang here. Uh, they're prophetic. These seven letters lay out a history in advance of the church as a body. And that's, if they were in any other order, this wouldn't be true. This is not a coincidence, not an accident. This is a designed characteristic. So let's just jump in here. Now, the churches, of course, are the church at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And they, the, so the, um, the, the, the letters have a, a, a name is used for the church, a title that Jesus selects of himself. And then he's got these four elements, commendation, concerns, exhortation, and a promise of the overcomer. And then that closing phrase. You with me so far? Okay. So, let's just talk about the names briefly. I'm not going to elaborate each one in detail, just to give you a flavor. The word Ephesus really means the di desired one, darling. And you'll see why when we read the letter. Smyrna was a term for myrrh, which was an embalming ointment. And it speaks of death. Pergamos, bigamy, monogamy, gammy means marriage. Pergamy is a false marriage, a perverted marriage, where the church marries the world, in effect. Thyatira is a little more complicated. We'll get to that. Sardis, uh, uh, we, we'll take each one. Each one describes, is descriptive of the main theme of each letter. As we'll see that as we go. I'll, I don't want to do it twice. In each case, we'll notice that Jesus selects an appropriate title of himself, which helps color the point that he's trying to make. So let's take a look at the letter to Ephesus. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, and then we have the title that Christ selects of himself. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. That was, those are idioms from chapter 1, because that's the way he, John saw him there when he first confronts him there in chapter 1. And uh, seven stars in his right hand, and he's in the midst of the golden lampstands. It's very interesting. The, the stars, they're both idioms of the church. On the one hand, we're right in his hand. He has the seven stars in his right hand. At the same time, he walks among us. See, both thoughts sound contradictory in a sense. Metaphorically, though, they both speak of attributes of his presence here. Okay. So he opens up with a commendation. Ephesus is getting the report card. Jesus says, I know thy works. Now, that's quite a thing to realize. He knows what we're doing. He has a running a, a tally of exactly where we stand, whoever we are. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And as we hear that, we're reminded just a few, a, a few sessions ago, when Paul arranges to drop by Miletus to, and has the, Ephesus, the uh, elders of Ephesus come meet him at Miletus, and he gives them his, in chapter 20, uh, this heartfelt, farewell address to the Ephesian elders. And he warned them that they're going to have false teachers emerge among them. And from this we gather they were on their toes. You see, thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and found them liars. That's the good news. They watched, they found out, they wouldn't tolerate that, you know, wrong teaching and so forth. They're getting commended for that. Follow me so far. Okay? And that echoes exactly what Paul warned about in chapter 20. And Jesus continues, and has borne and has patience for my namesake and has labored and has not fainted. And right about now, if you're an Ephesian, you're feeling pretty good. Wow, okay, we done, done good, huh? Then we get to that disturbing word, nevertheless. Up till now, you've been feeling good. And when the boss says, nevertheless, oops, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. What's that? 
because thou hast left thy first love. They apparently were so busy on the business of the king, they had no time for the king. So they're strong in doctrine. Strong on doctrine. But uh, not diligent in their devotional life. Their devotional life. And uh, that's where you grow in your devotional life. You grow in knowledge by studying the word. But you grow spiritually in your devotional life. So from this, Jesus gives them a specific exhortation. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy lampstand out of his place, except thou repent. So they've got to make a change. If they don't make a change, will they be unsaved? Of course not. But they may lose their witness. Where's the lampstand of Ephesus today? Ooh. But this thou hast, another final little good news here, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. This strange term is going to come up a couple of times in these letters. Nicolaitans, who are they? There are people that have tracked back cult groups that they believe are alluded to by the Nicolaitans. That's one possibility. It's on pretty thin ice from the things I've seen. It's a conjecture, in other words. There is, was this a first century sect abusing the liberty in Christ? Some scholars say so. Or... Is it simply an untranslated word? That's my leaning personally. The word nikeo in the Greek is the word for overcoming, conquering, ruling, nikeno. And the, nikeo, I mean. And laos is the term for people. We're going to see laodicea. The word laos there will show up in the last letter too. The people. This is the people ruling. Or ru ruling over the people, in other words. Most of the scholars that I lean on believe this is an allusion to the emergence of the clergy. The idea of clergy versus laity. Jesus gave us his organization chart when he washed the feet. He told us how he, you know, that he, that we, he, he's looking for people with a servant's heart, not a ruling heart. And so, and so the, the, using their clerical stature or position to rule over the laity emerges there. And that's something that goes totally against the grain of what Jesus was trying to get across in the upper room when he washed their feet, if you recall. So then he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And there's a footnote here, or a, a P.S. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now I want you to notice a subtlety here that's not true of all the letters you'll notice that the promise to the overcomer is appended to the letter. It's not in the letter. It's, on, it's like a, a PS. Just a subtlety, but I've come to conclude from my studies that none of these things are by accident because we're going to discover that's true of three, the first three letters and not true of the last four. We'll talk about that when we get there. But he that hath here, there's this, this closing phrase, if you will. Okay, we, now the next church is Smyrna unto the angel of the church in Smyrna right. These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Smyrna suggests myrrh, which is uh, metaphorically alluding to embalming or death. And this is the church that apparently was under brutal persecution. So Jesus, the title he chooses himself is the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. That's a, a title of Christ that they would take comfort in. And we need to remember that, that we do not serve a dead Christ, we serve a living Christ. He's alive. And, uh, but he, Jesus continues, I know thy works and thy tribulation and poverty, parenthesis, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So this is the commendation. That you know, I know thy works. There's that phrase again. And uh, they think they're poor, but they're actually rich. The, the other comment I'm going to anticipate here a little bit You'll notice that probably each recipient of these letters was surprised. Those that thought they were doing well really weren't. Those that didn't think they were doing well were doing better than they thought. So that's, that in itself should sober us a little bit. It means that our own assessment probably is not on the mark. And this should help us get, get things on the mark. Now we have an illusion here in verse 9. We're going to see the same kind of illusion in chapter 3, verse 9, 
about those, the, the blasphemy of those that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Who on earth could these be? And I'm going to suggest to you there's several possibilities, but I suggest that the key to all of this, and I won't take the time to fully develop it tonight, but I believe they're the Edomites. You may remember Esau and Jacob. They started fighting before, while they're still in the womb. And you know the story. The, the, the birthright fell upon Jacob. Well, actually, Esau sold his birthright to Jacob and uh, then regretted it. And the writer to the epistle of the Hebrews makes a big point of all of that. But you, to really understand this, you need to understand the subsequent history of the Edomites. When Esau could not get a blessing from Jacob, he deliberately married into the Ishmaelites to, to upset his parents. And he then becomes the primary leader of the uh, people who are adverse to, to, to uh, Israel. And uh, when the Babylonians later on are taking them captive to Babylon, the Edomites are on the perimeter cheering the Babylonians on and uh, telling them, you know, crush the skulls of the kids against the rocks and all the stuff. When you find that phrase in the psalm, it's a Jew echoing what they had yelled at him when he was going be made captive. The Edomites, uh, are, you're, you're a victim of the maps in your Bible which probably show Edom southeast of the Dead Sea, where they were originally. A little further east was the Nabataeans. The Nabataeans drive them westward and through those valleys into more fertile ground, actually. And they set up their kingdom on the west side of the Dead Sea, just south of Jerusalem. They make Hebron their capital. And if you look on the ancient Roman maps of the first century before and after Christ, you'll see Idumea, which is the Greek way of saying Edomite, uh, as a country. What am I getting at? Why am I going through all this? Well, as you may know, um, that... Uh, when Antiochus Epiphanes was in charge for the Greek uh, Seleucid Empire, um, he got so abusive that it precipitated the Maccabean Revolt. And the Maccabees actually threw off the yoke of the Greek Empire and set up their own government that ushered in a period of t history called the Hasmoneans from about roughly 140 B.C. through about 63 B.C. But the point is, during the reign of the Hasmoneans, John Hyrcanus the leader, forced the Edomites to become Jews. That's an inversion. You always hear stories where Jews are forced to become Christians in Spain and certain places. Well, this was the other way around, that the leadership, the Judean leadership, forced the Edomites among them to become Jews or, or die. So um, now, I want you to put yourself in the mentality of the Romans. After Pompeii, they conquer the area. They're running things now. To the Roman mind, this tension between Esau and Jacob, that's a family squabble. That's just a family squabble. To, to, a, to a Roman mind, an Edomite is a kind of Jew. Okay, in fact, they were forced to become Jews for a while. You need to understand that when the Romans appointed Herod, um, they, an, an Edomite, they thought they were appointing a kind of Jew. They didn't fully appreciate, probably, that he was the one that was hated by the true Jews, you see. So you get through the whole, you know, Herod the Great, and, and uh, you go right through the Herods uh, as you study your New Testament. Each one of them, the, the first one tries to kill the babes in Bethlehem, the other one uh, kills John the Baptist, another one kills James later, and so it goes. So the point is, um, as time goes on then, um, boy, um, I'm pausing because there's so much background here that's useful to you. I'll just point you to study the, the commentary of Obadiah, which is a commentary, a small little book, aimed primarily against the, against the Edomites. Now, just to give you another piece of the puzzle here, as I traveled with some of the rabbis, I discovered that when they talk about a globalist, these people that are aspiring to a global government, they call them Edomites. And I thought they're just using a metaphor. I said, why do you call them Edomites? Because many of them say they are Jews and are not. 
they may not even realize they're not really Jewish, they're Edomites, Edomian. Okay? And if you study the, the whole history of the Rothschilds, not Rothschild, that's mispronounced, it's Red Shield in German. And uh, uh, there's, a whole back, there's a whole background here that you, I'll let you go on your own. It's a, it's a possibility, at least, that the allusion here are to the traditional enemies of Israel, the Edomites, who today are in positions of substantial financial power. And just be aware of that. They say they are Jews not, but they are of what? The synagogue of Satan. That's pretty strong language used by the Lord himself. Let's move on. So the exhortation is, fear none of these things. He's, now he's, here, he, this letter is comforting the, the uh, church of Smyrna. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days, or ten periods. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Yet this, this whole encouragement are to those that have, are going to die, persecuted for Christ. And he's comforting them. And he's not saying they're not going to die. He's saying that they're, he's going to give them life, ultimately. So that's, uh, and again, I want you to notice the promise to the overcomer is outside the body of the letter. It's again a postscript. And we'll make something out of that when you see the whole picture here. There's an illusion of 10 days or 10 periods. And we generally, if you study the persecution of the church, there was, of course, Nero, 54 to 68. Then Domitian, that's where uh, John was exiled. And, and then Trajan and Marcus Aurelius and Septimus Severus and Maximus, Maximinus and uh, Decius, Valerian and Aurelian and Diocletian. And uh, so, and, and, and uh, these, there are 10 distinct periods and some people suspect that maybe that's the 10 days. It might be just a metaphor. It might be very specific. Uh, it does seem to fit for whatever reason. But we'll move on here. The next letter is to Pergamus. The word means a perverted marriage, actually. Unto the angel of the church in Pergamus write, These things saith he that hath the sharp sword with two edges. What's the sharp sword with two edges? Anyone? The word of God. Right on. It's the word of God that is the need of this situation here. Again, Jesus says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast at my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. And, uh, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So to really understand the flavor of the indictment here, you've got to do a little study of who is this character called Balaam. He was a prophet, strangely enough, out of Mesopotamia. And uh, Balak was the king that was adverse to Israel, and he, he, co he, he counseled the king on how to defeat Israel by casting a stumbling block before them to have this, the, his most attractive young girls camp around the periphery and get, get Israel to sin and then God would judge them. And that was the counsel that Balaam used to, to get them to stumble. But Jesus says, thou, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I had. Here's a second allusion to this Nicolaitan thing. What's his exhortation? Repent or else I'll come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So the, okay. Now the prophet Balaam there, you, you, in the scripture you'll find the doctor of Balaam, which is mentioned here, that's spiritual unchastity, marriage with the world. The way of Balaam is to be a hireling, making a market for his gift. The error of Balaam was sacrificing eternal riches for temporal gain. Because Jude makes a reference to the error of Balaam. Second Peter 2 makes a reference to the way of Balaam. They're all really alluding to this prophet who uh, sold himself and counseled Israel's enemies, and there's much more to the story to study, to spend some time on that one. But here he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone and a stone of the new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So that's the promise to the overcomer. You notice it follows again the he that hath an ear phrase. So we get to Thyatira. 
Now, by the way, just to give you a quick running, the, the, the Pergamos period seems to be the time when the church marries the world. The, the first era, the, well, we'll, go, we'll go through the, the eras here a little bit. I'll, I'll leave it till we get there. Thyatira, uh, th thus said the angel of the church to Thyatira, right? These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. In other words, the title that Jesus uses is he's a son of God. He's not the mother of God. He's not the, it, it's a, it's, you'll discover this thing is a very, it's the longest of the letters and it's very, very pointed. But it starts out by saying, I know thy works and charity and service and faith unto thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, oh boy, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I gave her space to repent for, of, her, her, of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. That's pretty wild. That, 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 that last statement is really disturbing. Because she has promised great tribulation unless she repent. Which means if she repent, she won't get the tribulation. Okay. Now this, the idioms here echo the story of Jezebel in 1 Kings 21. There's an episode there that I believe is very revealing that the Lord is making allusions to here. At that time, Queen Jezebel is married to King Ahab. And King Ahab is a very rich king. But there's a guy by the name of Naboth that has a real neat little vineyard that's right near where he has his, where he has, and he wants that vineyard. And he goes to Naboth, and Naboth does not want to sell. It's my vineyard. I like the vineyard. Don't bother me. And the king is in a pout. He's really upset because he, the more Naboth wouldn't sell, the more sure, he, he, that, then he knew he wanted it, right? The queen says to the Ahab, don't sweat it. Let me handle this for you. So the queen sets out. She arranges an inquisition. She gets some people to make some false statements against him, which causes him to be murdered. And when he's murdered, she gets the lens and gives it to Ahab. Guess what? I, look what I set up for you, buddy. False witnesses, condemnation, execution, and Naboth's vineyard is seized for the king. Does this metaphorically describe a period of history of the church? Let you think about that yourself. And I will kill her children with death and all the churches that shall know that I am he that searches the reins and the hearts. I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But, I say, but unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. See, finishing well is the name of the game. Now, there's a promise to the over, he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations. That was apparently an ambition of Thyatira, to have power over the nations. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. Uh, unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall be broken into shivers, so even as I received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. And this time, strangely, we have the promise to the overcomer in the body of the letter. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Okay. Now, as you probably may gather, the Protestant commentators have had a field day have had a field day with the apparent identity of Thyatira with the Vatican. It's not just that, but there clearly is that aspect to it all, especially with the Inquisition and all that stuff. Well, if Thyatira is the Catholic Church, Sardis would speak of the Reformation. That's what's followed, right? Let's look and see what it says here. Under the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and seven stars. That's apparently what they're missing, okay? Jesus says, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, and art dead. Whoa! This is one of the most severe letters 
that we come across. That you're in, in, in name only. This speaks of denominationalism. Be watchful and strengthen things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect or complete before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now this echoes 1 Thessalonians 5, where Paul reminds, if you are children of the day, it will not surprise you. The Lord comes as a thief of the night to the children of the night, but you are not of the night, you are of the day. That's the emphasis of the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. And Jesus echoes that here too. If thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief. That's if you're not watching. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. That implies that if you are watching, you won't be surprised. You may not date set, don't misunderstand me. But you won't be surprised if you're watching. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. But they're the exception, apparently. Then there's a promise to the overcomer. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I, will not, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He's not promising to blot anyone's out. He's just promising he won't blot them out. I get more questions about that strange thing. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay. Now we come to the good. Everybody, of course, is a Philadelphian. If you, if you know these letters, you know, this, well, this is us, the, the church that left Philadelphia, right? These things saith he is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. This is the missionary church. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and, kept, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. So again, there's that echo, this, this strange allusion to those that say they are Jews and are not, whoever they are. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the, all, all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 is one of the most exciting promises in the scripture. The church at Philadelphia says, he says to them, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Not from temptation, from the time. The, the, the concept of the time of the tribulation. Which shall come upon all the world. You're not going to be here when that happens. That's coming upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. The book of Revelation speaks of the earth dwellers in contrast to those that are saved. We are not earth dwellers. We don't dwell, we may be pilgrims here, but this isn't our home. So come to, to try, to, to, to come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Wow. You mean someone can take your crown? Yes, absolutely. You have inheritance set aside for you, but you can blow it. Not your salvation. Jesus paid for that 100% on the cross 2,000 years ago. Done deal. He did it all. You can't add to what he had done. He's done already. That's blasphemy to even try. But you can forfeit the inheritance that's set aside for you. He that overcometh will I make a pillar of the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of the heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear as the Spirit says to the churches. Okay. We come to the last one. And uh, to the Laodiceans. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness. The beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold nor hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I love the uh, introduction that Dr. William Welty provided for the book my wife and I published called The Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory. And is in his very colorful foreword to the not the introduction, but the foreword to the book. He says, John 
must certainly have been puzzled. He's on the island of Patmos about to receive the most fantastic uh, revelation of the Lord Jesus himself. And yet we find him, John must, John must have been puzzled because pu uh, puzzled, Jesus is sick. He's so sick, he's about to throw up. <laughs> and of course he's alluding to this here, this whole, I, I will spew thee out of my mouth. He's about to vomit. This is probably the strongest language of, of all the letters. Because thou sayest, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Uh, William likes to point out that these preachers that are on television with their Rolex watches and their, and you know, the, the Lord wants you to be rich kind of message, the, you know, the, the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it guys, he always likes to say, that's scriptural. What they're saying is scriptural. Really? Yeah. Got to look at verse 17, chapter 3. Thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. There it is. It's scriptural. But Jesus says, you know not that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And of course, he's being facetious or sarcastic when he says it. That's scriptural. Jesus says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold right in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, the next verse, if you take it alone, is one of the most used verses in evangelism. And uh, you've all seen this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. How many have heard that before? You've all heard evangelists use that as a closing verse. And that's fine. Don't misunderstand me. That's fine. However, that's taken out of context. Where this verse sits is the most scathing indictment of all against the Laodicean church. First of all, where is Jesus? Outside, knocking to get in. And the promise he has isn't to the group. It's to the individual that'll be the exception. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, one of you, maybe, somebody, if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. It's a glorious promise, but in the context, it's a scathing indictment of the Laodicean church. Jesus outside, knocking to get in. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And then it closes it out. Now, if we take all these letters, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia, we'll notice that on the commendations, there are two letters that had nothing good said about them. Sardis and Laodicea had no commendation. There wasn't something, well, you did this, that, or the other thing. Well, it didn't say any of that. There isn't any commendation given to Sardis. Sardis is the one that has a name only, but is actually dead. Treat that as dead denominationalism. Laodicea, same thing. There's nothing positive said about them. There's a positive promise to the exception. It's interesting there are two letters that have nothing good said about them. There are two letters that have nothing bad said about them. And that is Smyrna, because they're facing death. I'll give you nothing else but just to hang in there is what he says. And of course, Philadelphia. They're the two that come out great in this report card. You with me so far? Two that really blew it, Sardis and Laodicea. Two that are in solid shape, Smyrna and Philadelphia. Now, something else we noticed. We have this strange closing phrase called, um, and by the all have an exhortation, of course. Uh, he that hath an ill of spirit says, the promise to the overcomer is outside the letter for the first three, brought inside the letter for the last four. And um, what I've told you up till now, you can probably find in any conservative commentary on the book. This is something that I've yet to really uh, see anyone else develop. So 
be cautious. I may be very wrong by my perspective here. I'll just show you what I think it is implied here. as Because we, we'll discover there are other attributes that distinguish the first three from the last four. I believe the Holy Spirit intentionally clustered these in two groups. And uh, if we take a look at these letters as historical periods, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Ephesus seems to speak validly of the apostolic church. Very strict in doctrine, fell away devotionally for a while. Smyrna is the persecuted church. It speaks of that period when to be a Christian was to suffer death. Pergamus is the married church. You get to the third century in the state where Constantine makes Christianity legal. The second guy after him makes it the state religion. Big mistake. You now have unregenerate people in positions of leadership. It's a state organization. There's no Holy Spirit ordaining leadership and so forth. That's when the church married the world. Big mistake. What Satan couldn't uh, 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 gain by persecution, he found a better way. I'll just have it. I'll just marry it. Have the, the world marry the church. Caused more damage than the pers persecution had the church grow worldwide, strangely. Now, of course, after the married church, we come to the medieval church. And I'll use the Vatican only as one of many idioms there, where the church becomes very powerful and abusive in many ways. And, uh, but again, if, with the Protestant commentators taking a field day, you'll find lots of writing about Thyatira and the Vatican. And, and probably one of the most illuminating books you can lay your hands on is by David Hunt called The Woman Rides the Beast, which deals with, don't confuse the woman who rides the beast with the beast. They're two different things. And he really documents it very well. A real expose. I have some slightly different points of view, but that's not important. It's a great book. It's a must read for any serious Christian. Okay, after the medieval church, though, we now come to the denominational church that are in name only, but spiritually dead. And of course, after that, you get to the missionary church. That's the big winner. And you get to the final one, which is the apostate church. And I, uh, you can come to your own conclusions at what period you think we are in. But I'll hastily add, you can probably find elements of all seven in every church to different degrees. Two, two teaspoons of this and two, four tablespoons of that or whatever. But you can formulate these seven, the sevenfold uh, decision space into those parameters. But we said that we noticed that these first three um, letters had the promises to the overcomer postscripted. Now, I don't know why, but they clearly are distinctive from that point of view. The last four, the promises are in the body of the letter, from which I'm convinced the Holy Spirit wanted to call our attention to a distinction between these two groups. In fact, if we examine the last four a little more closely, we'll discover they each, and only these, contain explicit references to the second coming. Well, that's kind of exciting. Now, we do know that one of these four, in fact, the first of the four, Thyatira has promised that if they don't change their ways, they're going to be in the Great Tribulation. If that's the case, that implies that if they do change their ways, they won't be in the Great Tribulation. The third of these last four, the missionary church, is promised to be removed before the tribulation. Now that leaves these other two, Sardis and Laodicea, problematic. That's a possibility. I believe it's probably justifiably descriptive, but I leave it to you to make your own study and come to your own conclusions. But I hope that illumination you find useful to some, to at some level. Now it's interesting in Revelation 2 and 3, we have these seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. In Matthew 13, we have seven kingdom parables. The sower in the four soils, the tares and the wheat, the mustard seed, the woman of leaven, treasure of the field, pearl of great price, and the dragnet. Now it's kind of provocative here, and I won't try to go through all seven. I'll just pick a couple 
if you look at the mustard seed, the mustard seed parable is often misunderstood. That's where you see a little mustard seed that grows to a, although it's a very small seed, it grows to a tree that the birds inhabit the branches. A lot of people say, well, gee, that's wonderful. No, it isn't. If you visit Israel, you know mustard seeds grow to a bush that's about two and a half feet high. All those yellow flowers in the spring are mustard seed bushes. Have you seen birds nest in a three foot high bush? Not very often. What's suggested in this mustard seed has become a monstrosity. It's become a tree so large the birds of the air that lay in its branches. Well, who are these birds? When you study Matthew 13 and the, the four soils, the birds are, made, are identified as Satan's ministers. You mean this thing grows so big that it's even the home of Satan's ministers? That's, that is a very possible suggestion. The other, that's followed by the woman and the leaven. Kingdom of heaven is like a woman who put uh, uh, leaven in three measures of meal. Now, if you're Jewish, you gasp in horror. You're not supposed to put leaven in three, three measures of meal is the fellowship offering. Putting leaven in there is to contaminate it. It's not a good thing. Leaven in the Old Testament and the New is always an evil thing. Jesus says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Speaking of hypocrisy and so on. Well, the, the letter to Thyatira spoke of the woman Jezebel and the false doctrine and so forth. You begin, if you study the seven letters and you study these seven parables, I'm going to suggest you're going to discover some surprising parallelism of each, each one. To the, now, it shouldn't surprise us because the same guy that gave the seven parables is the same guy that wrote the seven letters. So any parallelism uh, uh, is probably not accidental. But the one that I like the best is Philadelphia. Because the king of heaven is like, a, like the pearl of a great price. A merchant finds a pearl and it sells everything he has to get it and so forth. Well, what makes that so strange, again, you've got to think Jewish. Pearls are not kosher. It's a Gentile gem. It's the only occasion where the jewel is a response to irritation and it grows by accretion. And it's removed from its place of growth to become an item of adornment. What an elegant metaphor for the church. A church that's raptured. Which of the seven letters speaks of the raptured church? Interesting. Just a coincidence, of course. Seven churches. What about Paul? I wouldn't call Paul a mystic. But he wrote these seven, he read, did you know that he wrote seven churches? He wrote 14 epistles, right? Three were to pastors, you got, and you got two, that, that gives you ten. Two of those were, uh, three of those were duplicates, excuse me. First and second, first and second, whatever. So you, you've got, Paul actually addressed seven different churches. Really? Did he, well, Ephesus is an easy one, he wrote Ephesus, right? Smyrna, did he write a, one of his epistles to celebrate joy through suffering? A letter that could be easily addressed to Smyrna. Philippians. Absolutely. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Did he write a letter to the married church, the worldly church? First and second Californians, right? <laughs> the word Corinth became synonymous with adulterer or fornicate, fornicating. If you are a fornicator, you are a Corinthian. So I always, when I teach, First and Corinthians, I like to call it First and Second Californians. Okay, Thyatira. I'm going to suggest the remedy for Thyatira is the Epistle to the Galatians. Sardis, oh boy, um, name only, dead. Paul's Gospel to the uh, his, his, uh, the Gospel according to Paul, Epistle to the Romans. Philadelphia. Is there an epistle that Paul wrote that has to do with the uh, rapture? Two of them. The first one about the rapture itself, and the second one why it had to be before the tribulation. Thessalonians. And that leaves one left, Colossians, which you discover if you do some homework, is virtually a suburb of Laodicea. They're about one mile apart. And they were instructed to exchange letters. If you read the letter to Colossians, they're instructed to exchange. So I think that's kind of interesting. There seems to be a pattern. Now, in the case of Paul, if there is a pattern, that's the finger of the Holy Spirit. 
Because Paul was not a mystic following a model, I don't believe. Okay. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, the things which shall be hereafter. That was the outline we were looking at. The first chapter being the vision of Christ, the second and third chapters being the seven churches, and then the things which shall be, metatauta is the Greek phrase, the things that shall be hereafter, after these things. When you get to chapter 3, end of chapter 3, you get to chapter 4, verse 1, and the first Greek term is metatauta, meaning after these things. So that's the rapture on. A lot of good scholars have different views about the details from chapter uh, 4 or 5, uh, especially from 6 to 19, but uh, that's, that's... We get to chapter 5. John says, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll or to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the scroll, neither to look thereon. And I sobbed convulsively because no man was found worthy to open and to read the scroll, neither to look thereon. It's interesting, the emphasis here, it had to be a man, not an angel. We're looking for a kinsman redeemer, a kinsman of Adam who blew it. They need a man. No man in heaven or earth, neither under the, was able to open the scroll, neither to look thereon. That's the first, that's the first cut here. And John understands, you and I don't understand, but he does. So I wept much, I sobbed much, because no man was found worthy to open the scroll, but that's premature judgment. One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals, the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood the lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes and the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Again, metaphors from chapter 1. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb as it had been slain. And uh, so we've just skimmed through. I'm going to encourage you to take, to, to springboard from this on your own into the apocalypse, the unveiling. The, the, and understand the catastrophic end, crisis, end crises of the present age. And you're going to see the spectacular reappearance of the King of Kings in his global empire. You'll see the internment of Satan, not the eliminating of him yet. He'll be interned for, in the Abusa for a thousand years. Why? To leave man without excuse, and even without Satan out there, we still blow it. And then we, we'll have the millennial earth reign of Christ, and which most teach, uh, nine out of ten churches don't believe. You decide yourself by reading your Bible. And we'll see the final insurrection and the abolition of sin and a new heaven and a new earth. It's not just you and I that are redeemed. Heaven and earth are redeemed. That says a lot. The Old Testament is the account of a nation. The New Testament is the account of a man. We're not about a religion. We're about a person. The Creator became a man. That's staggering. His appearance is the central event of all history. Everything in the universe is going to be measured by that event on that wooden cross in Judea 2,000 years ago. He died to purchase us and he is alive now. There's nothing that can touch you. He is, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the, in the world. And uh, you need to avail yourself of that. You need to understand who he is. The more you know about him, the more you'll love him. And the more you love him, the more you'll want to know more yet. It's a, it's a courtship. It's a lifetime deal. It's not a decision walking down the sawdust. You know, we, we have a tendency in, in our modern culture to celebrate someone coming to Christ like some kind of victory. And I'm not demeaning it. It is a victory for, of his. But we need to not see it as a victory. or a, It's not a finishing line. It's a starting gun. How many of you are saved in here? Why? Why were you saved? Why did God say, God has ordained a miracle and it started before the foundation of the world. God had you on his mind before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1.4. So why did he save you? There's a collective reason, an aggregated reason to magnify his name and there's a number of good answers for that if you're going to take an essay quiz or something. But there's a personal reason. 
God had a specific personal reason to, to arrange the miracle that he arranged to have you sitting here right now. And the great adventure in life is to discover what that reason was or is. To discover what it is he's called you for. There is something that he saved you for. And I suspect it's different for every one of us. How many of you have discovered your calling? I won't, okay, we got, you know what, maybe 10, 20% here. That's at least a good honest answer. There are a lot of heads that aren't up. Ah, you're looking at me sort of surprised. Okay, that's okay. If you're saved, praise God for that. Have you discovered your calling yet? Because it's my presumption that he has given you a supernatural gift and when you discover what that is, you'll discover what he's called you to do. And every one of us in this room has a different calling than everybody else. We're not all called to be evangelists. We're not all called to lead Bible studies. There's a whole list of things that we may very well fall on that list. But the point is, discovering what it is, is your grand adventure. So I encourage you. Your most exalted privilege is to know him. And that's what the Bible, the word of God, is all about. As you know, we be, just to tie this off, most of you know that our entire motivation in our peculiar ministry is based on two discoveries. That this, these 66 books are separate books penned over a period of almost 2,000 years by over 40 authors who didn't even know each other. And yet, we, by studying it, we discover it's a design package. It's what an information scientist would call an integrated message system. Every idiom, idiom every detail, bears evidence of being designed exactly a certain way. And designed that way, it makes a tapestry. When you stand back, you realize the whole thing's designed. Now, once you discover that, you're confronted with another dis uh, discovery you got to embrace. That the origin of this message had to originate outside time. Outside space-time, to be more, more precise. And... Uh, that's staggering. You, can, you, say, you can't prove the Bible. Yes, you can. You can prove its integrity, and from that you can prove its origin from outside time. And once you discover that, you'll discover it presents on every page details about a specific person, the person of Jesus Christ, the kinsman redeemer, the one who is able to step forward and open that seven-sealed book and redeem the world. There are over 8,000 predictive verses in the Bible and almost 2,000 predictions on 700 different matters. That's just according to one form of cataloging by J. Barton Payne. Our challenge is to realize that you and I are being plunged into a period of time now about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history. And uh, that includes the Gospel period. When Jesus walked the shores of Galilee, climbed the mountains of Judea, what have you. There's more said in the Bible about the period we're moving into than it does even about the gospel period. That's an outrageous statement. And I want to challenge you to, to not accept it. If you accept that statement, you flunk. I want you to challenge it by doing two things. Find out what the Bible really says. Yourself, don't delegate that. Find out what it says. And secondly, find out what's really going on. And you won't in our environment, which is the age of deceit. Wall Street, and, and our capital city, both Washington, D.C., are aggressively lying through their teeth. And most informed investors understand that. But you need to find out, find out that all by yourself and find out how you can find out what's really, what's really going on. So that's the challenge I want to leave you with. And uh, so you and I are in possession of a message of extraterrestrial, or extraterrestrial origin, which tells us we are in a warfare. We are in a warfare. And uh, we'll be talking about that in some subsequent sessions. The kind, we're moving into what they, some experts are calling the age of hybrids. What on earth is that all about? You mean Nephilim? Probably. You're talking about UFOs? Maybe. You're talking about transhumanism? What's that all about? Well, we'll talk about that. But there is a war, there's a cosmic war going on around us. And your eternal destiny depends on your relationship 
we're the ultimate victor in that conflict. You need to understand what's going on. You need to understand what's forthcoming. The question is, where do you stand? Not with the church organization. Not where you spend Sunday morning. That isn't the issue. I'm not disparaging any of that. You need to know where you stand with respect to the person who is alive today that once hung on that cross. Where do you stand with respect to him? So with that, let you and I stand for a closing word of prayer. This concludes our series on the church, the book of Acts and the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. I encourage you to pray through what your next book should be, but certainly pick one and dig into it and continue your path here.